Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would come by your spirit and that you would awaken us to the glories of heaven and the glories of the new world, the new heavenized world that is to come. I pray that you would awaken us to who we are right now in this world and how we are to be and how we are to think and how we are to live. Lord, I pray that you would do far more abundantly than I can think or imagine. Your word never goes out in vain and accomplishes all of its purpose, Isaiah says. So we trust that it will go forth and do your work. We also pray that you would give ears to hear, eyes to see these realities and hearts that love them, cherish them, and legs and feet that will walk in them. pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. One of the clear teachings of Scripture is that the church is a pilgrim people. We are exiles and sojourners who are journeying toward our heavenly home, heaven and ultimately, in the resurrection, a new heavenized world, the heavens and earth that are new. In fact, the book of Hebrews, which we've been studying for over a year now, gives us this very paradigm regarding God's people as pilgrims. Hebrews 3.16 says, For who are those, or were those, who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? There's Exodus. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? There's wilderness. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter the rest because of unbelief. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews says, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of us or you should seem to have failed to reach it. Meaning the writer of Hebrews in this text is taking the wilderness promised land pattern coming out of Egypt, going through the wilderness, and heading toward the promised land from the Old Testament, the very land of rest, the promised land of rest given to, to Abraham in Genesis. And he is taking this paradigm and he is reapplying it to the new covenant people in terms of heaven and earth. Not merely a physical earthly reality, but it's a distinction between earth and heaven. Meaning, the earth as it now stands, according to the writer of Hebrews, is the wilderness. It is a wilderness. The entire world, according to the writer of Hebrews, is the wilderness. That's his theology. And we, being in the wilderness right now, likewise, are to have our eyes fixed upon the promised rest, the promised land of rest, Canaan, which is above that's the paradigm, which means by necessity that we are pilgrims on earth who are moving through a wilderness world heavenward. The same paradigm is given in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, meaning they're not at home, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And we can know he's not merely calling them sojourners and exiles because they're away from their earthly home, because he connects their sojourning and their being exiles to the passions of the flesh, to sin, to temptation. Meaning the issue here is that they are away from their heavenly home, living on earth in the wilderness as exiles, where a war is being waged against their soul. That's the idea. Meaning as long as we live in this world, we are exiles and sojourners who are waging war, and a war is being waged against us in regard to our soul. And therefore, in another sense, in the scriptures, we live in Babylon, and we are called to come forth from Babylon. Calvin affirms this, 
view of 1 Peter 2.11, when he says, Sojourners and strangers, so he calls them not because they were banished from their country and scattered into various lands, but because the children of God, wherever they may be, are only guests in this world. And many others have seen this sojourner, pilgrim, exile theme and pattern in the scriptures. In fact, John Bunyan, if you know, wrote an entire book, an allegorical story about the Christian life called Pilgrim's Progress. And the whole plot line of that famous story is a man named Christian who leaves the city of destruction and moves forward on a pilgrimage until he reaches the celestial city, passing through the river of death to get there. Meredith Klein, a student of Voss and Van Til, says, from the fall until the inauguration of the world to come at the consummation, that is the end, life for the people of God is always a pilgrim journey through an alien wilderness under the shadow of death. And here Klein reminds us of why this world is now called a wilderness, a wilderness wasteland, over which the shadow of death hangs. And the answer is the fall of man, sin. Adam's sin in the garden, which has now left the entire cosmos and all of mankind corrupted by sin. Not only the cosmos, but man in body and soul, leaving men dead in their sins, spiritually dead, and physically dying, and heading toward eternal death, unless we are made alive by the Spirit of Christ, according to Ephesians 2. And so this world, because of sin and death, is in the scriptures now called in its totality a wilderness wasteland that will pass away. It will be destroyed by fire. And therefore, if that's true, and if we are pilgrims, and if this is a wilderness, and if we are in exile... And if we are just passing through with our eyes on something else, then we must live that way. We must live as pilgrims who understand that this is not our home. Psalm 102 says, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. This world will perish, but you, O oh God, the immutable one, the eternal and infinite one, you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Therefore, if this world, according to the scriptures, is now a wilderness, and if, according to the scriptures, we are a pilgrim people under the shadow of death, then we must, if we are to have any hope at all, put our hope elsewhere. And the answer in the scriptures is heaven, paradise above where the trees and river of life are. And not only are our eyes to be fixed there and our hearts to be fixed there, but according to Paul, we are already presently counted as citizens of heaven. Even though we live on the earth. That's what Paul says in Philippians 3.20. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. That's where it is. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if this is where our citizenship is, the world and reality to which we truly belong, then it follows that our focus must be there as well. Which is why Paul in another place, Colossians 3, says that because our citizenship is in heaven, it's Philippians 3.20, we are to seek the things that are above, Colossians 3.1, where Christ is, setting our minds on things that are above, not on earth. We are to set our minds on the promised land of rest above Canaan as we move and traverse through this wilderness valley over which death hangs. But scripture does not just call this world a wilderness. 
Paul in Galatians 1.4 calls it a present evil age or world. Romans 8.18 calls it a present time that is marked by suffering. Ephesians 6.12 calls it this present darkness. And thus it's a kind of chaos. An evil, dark realm of suffering. A world which because of sin has undergone a kind of decreation or retrograde. It is destabilized. And it is heading toward destruction. Not absolutely, but it will be a thorough renewal in such a way that this world is to perish. And what's interesting is that the way the writer of, uh, the, the way Jeremiah describes this, and the way Paul describes this, it sounds very much like the chaotic reality that existed before. God spoke light into existence. Here's what I mean. This is what Jeremiah says about Israel and the land as a result of sin and the judgment of God and the curse and all that's hanging over the people. Jeremiah 4.23 says, I looked on the earth and behold, it was without form and void. And the heavens, and to the heavens they had no light. Meaning, even, even in the present state of the world, because of sin, the present world in Jeremiah is given in terms of the pre-created reality. Because where do we get the language of without form and void and no light? Genesis 1-2. Genesis 1-2 says the earth was without form and void. There it is, same Hebrew words. And darkness was over the face of the deep. That's Jeremiah 4.23 and Genesis 1-2. It's a direct correlation. Meaning, here's the point. Whether we are reading Paul with his emphasis on darkness and suffering, or whether we are reading Jeremiah who focuses on the formless, empty reality because of sin and darkness that is covering the earth without light, the bottom line is that all of this alludes to Genesis 1-2, which means that there is a direct correlation now between what we call the wilderness and the pre-creation state in Genesis 1-2. This is very important for later. And I'll show you why as we get there. But this same language, the waste language and the spirit of God hovering over the uncreated matter language, all of that shows up again in Deuteronomy 32 to define the wilderness. Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 12, it says, He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste. That's Tohu. That's from Genesis 1-2. Of the wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided them. Do you see what the writer of Deuteronomy, this Moses, is saying about the wilderness? They come out of the Exodus and they come into a wasted wilderness. And that wilderness is described in the same language as Genesis 1-2. And what do we see in Genesis 1-2? We see the Spirit of God hovering over this chaotic, formless mess. And when he speaks light into existence, creation is changed. It is formed. And what we see in Deuteronomy 32 is the exact same pattern. You have Israel now in the wilderness, in this formless, void wasteland, and the Lord himself, like an eagle, is hovering over his people. What's the point? The point is this present world is now called a wilderness lace wasteland, which is described in pre-creation language, the language of Genesis 1-2, where darkness covers a formless, empty void as it awaits for the Lord to speak. And therefore, because of this connection between wilderness and the formless, void reality in which we live, 
due to sin, Satan, and death, this present world, because we live in it, we must live in it looking for, as pilgrims who dwell in this empty void, nothing less than a new creation. That's why I make the stink about the connections between wilderness and the language described, and the same language that is used in the pre-creation state of Genesis 1-2, because it puts us in the exact same place, meaning that as we live in this wilderness world, which is described as a wasteland, formless and void, with darkness covering the world, what we are waiting for, as if we are in Genesis 1-2, is for God to say, let there be light, in the new creation sense. We are in Genesis 1-2, in a sense, waiting for verse 3, and this new creation that we are longing for in this present wilderness wasteland as exiles is the very thing that God promises to his people. And therefore, Genesis 1 doesn't only give us a pattern for the original creation, which it does, but Genesis 1 also gives us the paradigm for the new creation. Because we now, because of sin, have been pushed back into a retroactive reality that puts us in a formless void covered by darkness. And therefore, we need a new creation. And that's what God has promised. Isaiah 65, 17 through 19. He says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sounds of weeping and the cry of distress. And this is taken up by John in Revelation. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Therefore, this present world, which is described in Genesis 1-2 language as a formless void covered by darkness, will give way to a new creation at the return of the creator king, who is Jesus Christ. A new creation which is already present in power in heaven where Christ is in whom we share by the Spirit in our union with him, as we'll see. Therefore, what we need to understand is that between now and the new creation, or even death, which takes us into heaven, where the power and person of this new creation dwells, until then, death or the new creation at his return, at his return Scripture tells us that we are pilgrims. And in fact, Gerhardus Voss, in one of his sermons, Heavenly Mindedness, he says Christians are pilgrims with heaven's door open wide in our sight. This is who we are. And before I move on to point out how we actually participate in these worlds simultaneously, at the same time, this present world and the new world to come, which is present in its power in heaven, I want to point out something obvious that we need to be reminded of time and time again as the church of Jesus Christ in this present wilderness and darkness. And that is that the wilderness is a time of testing and trial. It's a time of pain and suffering. It's a time of tribulation, flipsis, affliction. And it will be until we die or Christ returns. Acts 14, 21 and following, Paul says, or it says, when they, that is Paul and Barnabas here, had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra 
and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations or afflictions or much suffering, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's what Piper calls Discipleship 101. Prepare to suffer in the path of following Christ into the kingdom of God. Jesus himself says this before he leaves. In John 16, he says, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome Nike. I have been victorious over the world. And what kind of tribulations or afflictions or suffering? Well, the answer is suffering of every kind. Every kind you can imagine. Physical suffering, sickness suffering, mental suffering, soul suffering, suffering in your marriage, suffering in the home with the kids, suffering in the workplace, suffering in the church, Persecution and spiritual war. And why all the suffering? Because of sin. The very sin which came into the world through Satan and then Adam in the garden. And yet, here's the key, brothers and sisters. In the midst of all of this suffering which you will not avoid in this wilderness wasteland as pilgrims. In the midst of this, God promises to us as his pilgrim people under the shadow of death that it will be for our good. Romans 8, 28, for those who love God, all things, that all there means all. All things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And not only will all of this suffering work for our good, but we also need to know as we live here with our eyes on heaven, With our eyes on the Christ of heaven, we need to know that none of this affliction, none of this suffering, nothing in this present darkness can separate us from God and his love for us. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? 37. No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than overcomers. What's he mean there? Well, I don't know exactly. I'll tell you what I think it means. We're not just conquerors in the sense that we overcome these realities. But we are more than conquerors in the sense that these very realities which threaten to undo us serve us. And working for our good according to the plan and decree of God. Paul goes on to say, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, visible and invisible, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But now, seeing that the world in which we live is passing away, 1 John 2, 17. We need to consider how we can, in fact, belong to both worlds at the same time. How can we live in a world that is passing away, as John says, and the scriptures in totality say, and how can Paul say that our citizenship is presently in heaven? How can we be in two places at once? Or how can we belong to two places at once? Well, the answer is, and it's not a trick question or answer, the answer is Christ by the Spirit. That's the answer. Christ by the Spirit is the way we belong to two worlds, one visible and one invisible for now, even though it will not remain invisible. And why do we say this? Well, 
Because Jesus, who is the eternal Son of God, he came from the very heavens that we will be entering into. And he came from those very heavens, entering into this present wilderness world as a pilgrim, coming to live and die for us, living for our righteousness according to the law, dying to bear the wrath of God in our place, so that we can be accounted as righteous and forgiven by faith alone. We know all of that. But yet this Christ who came from the invisible heavens to which we are going, and then the new creation, he did not just come to earth and traverse the earth as a pilgrim and die for our sins. And he wasn't just buried, but he was raised up from the grave in glory. And what happens next? Well, here's the answer, Acts 1, 9 through 11. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Meaning the answer is, after his resurrection, after being a pilgrim in this wilderness wasteland, he ascends out of sight. And where does he ascend to? The answer is heaven. The invisible temple realm of God in the highest heavens where our citizenship is, where our minds are to be. And we know he's there because scripture tells us over and over and over again that he has ascended and that he has sat down at the right hand of God. And if you want a clear picture of Christ in heaven at the right hand of God, just think about what Stephen sees when he's being stoned as a Christian. The heavens are opened and Stephen looks into the invisible heavens and he sees Christ standing there waiting upon him as he falls asleep in death and moves into the intermediate state which is presently in heaven. Christ came, he descended, he lived, he died, he was buried, he was raised, and he has ascended back to the very realm from which he came. Because of this, Calvin says, since he who is our head has ascended to heaven, it is fitting in us to withdraw our affections from the earth and with our whole soul aspire to heaven. I love that quote from Calvin. But I still haven't really answered the question. How are we counted as citizens of heaven, even though we are on earth and, and Christ is in heaven, as we've just proven? Well, the answer to that is not Acts 1, but Acts 2. Because who now comes in Acts 2? Who is poured out in Acts 2? The answer is the Spirit. That is a crucial fact to understand and see. Meaning that when the Spirit is poured out in Acts 2 from heaven, after Christ ascends into the very highest heavens, to which we belong as citizens and are going in our death before the new creation, this event, which we call Pentecost, the pouring out of the Spirit, we have to understand that this is, this is a Christ event. Right. This is not a repeatable reality. This is a once-for-all reality, just like his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And what is he doing in this reality? He is sending his spirit from heaven. Why? That we might be filled with that very spirit and united to him in a one-flesh union as his body on earth. Do you see now? How we're moving toward an answer for how we can belong to two worlds at the same time regarding the Spirit in Christ. When Christ, think of it this way, brothers and sisters. Remember at the end of John, Christ is raised and you have, um, you have Mary and she goes to Christ and it says that she, she holds on to him. She hugs him. Rabboni, you should read that boss sermon too. 
But he, she, she clings to him. And what does Jesus say? He says, don't, don't cling to me. I must, I must ascend to your father and my father, your God and my God. Why? Because in her clinging to him, he is kept on earth where he does not belong as the glorified and risen Christ. He must ascend and cling to her from heaven by his spirit. From heaven, where the power of the age to come is already present. And it's in this union with Christ by the Spirit, which he inaugurates from heaven by his Spirit, in which he calls us forth and unites us to himself by a Spirit-wrought faith. That is how we become heirs and citizens of heaven, even though we live on earth. It is in our union with the risen and ascended Christ who presently dwells in that highest heavens by the Spirit. That is how we are called citizens of heaven. This world we belong to by birth, the world to come we belong to by rebirth and faith. We are united to Christ. We are truly connected to him who is in heaven by the spirit, who belongs to heaven, who belongs to the world to come. And therefore the spirit is the down payment and the assurance, the surety of our heavenly inheritance. As he keeps us and guards us and draws us into eternity towards the risen and ascended Christ. Meaning that the Spirit is the key. If we are to understand how we can presently be pilgrims on earth and yet citizens of heaven where Christ is. Christ clings to us by his Spirit. And we are so united to Christ by the Spirit in a one flesh covenantal union that Paul can say that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians. We are so united to Christ by his spirit presently that Paul can say we have been raised with Christ. Wherever Christ is, we are, according to Paul, because of our union with him by the spirit. He is the head and we are the body and it is an indivisible bond. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. This is what we call the already not yet reality in Paul's theology. There is an already reality which is objectively and biblically true. We have died with him. We have been buried with him. We have been raised with him. We have even been ascended with him into the highest heavens. All by the Spirit, even though we presently live on this earth as pilgrims. And yet, all of those things which are a true and present reality now will be made visible in the end when he raises us up from the dead so that we are in his presence forever. But until that reality comes, until we enter into eternity, into the presence of Christ in heaven or the new creation, until that day, church, we are a pilgrim people. And we live as exiles under the shadow of sin, suffering, and death. And therefore the paradigm for us as the church of Jesus Christ in this state, the pattern for us is the pattern of Abraham, the pattern of Israel in the wilderness, and others. In Hebrews 11, regarding Abraham, our father in the faith, according to Paul, Right? If we are believers, if we are people of faith, the very faith of Abraham, we are sons and daughters of Abraham, which means we are pilgrims like he was, with a promise of a land of rest. This is what the writer of Hebrews says as we come to a close. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That was my life verse for a while. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. Already not yet. There it is. 
living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he, get this, as a pilgrim, as an exile, living in a tent, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Which is what? The very reality to which we are looking. The new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, the city of God, which is to come, whose builder and maker is God himself with an omnipotent and infinite power. And therefore, like Abraham, who is our father, a pilgrim, fathering pilgrims, we are to press on in faith with our eyes on Christ, who is in heaven and whose trail and train we follow. And just as he moved through this world and into the world to come, so will we. And therefore, Hebrews 13, 14, here we must understand, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us fix our hearts, our minds, our souls on the things that are eternal. This world and our bodies, the outer man, is passing away day by day. But the inner man is being renewed, Paul says. Therefore, let us focus not on the things that are visible and transient, but on the things that are invisible and eternal. For in a very short time, the glory fire of God will break forth from the heavens, the very fire from which the new creation will emerge. The new creation in which we will live in glorified spiritual bodies before the face of Christ forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father, help us to be free from the anxieties and cares of this world. Help us not to be consumed with that which is seen, but with that which is unseen. And yet at the same time, Lord, help us not to be so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. But help us to, to be the kind of heavenly minded people that are so heavenly minded and so motivated by Christ and all that he's done. The very Christ who dwells in the highest heavens. Help us to be so motivated and impassioned by that that we can't help but to be earthly good. Help us to be like the exiles in Jeremiah 29 who, although not home, were called to do all that they could in the place where they were in Babylon. Lord, help us not to be marked by the passions and the sins and the pleasures of this world, but help us to be marked by all that Christ is as he works in us by his Spirit as we're united to him by that spirit and through faith. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our priest, king in heaven. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.